Chapter 20, Breakdown I listened to the unknown speaker's report on the audio cassette a second time. It made absolutely no difference to me who this person was. The conclusions he reached had such an effect on me that not only did I have any desire to continue writing, but my life itself began to seem meaningless. Anastasia's concept of man's significance was actually starting to grow on me, about how each man is the beloved child of God, that he can be happy right here on earth. One only needs to gain a proper understanding of one's purpose. I believed Anastasia and believed in the possibility of changing our life today for the better by transforming our lifestyle and building new communities. But all of my faith collapsed after hearing what was on the cassette. The thing was that the facts cited by the speaker regarding the coincidences that had happened to me, which in his words formed a pattern, were, were spot on. Everything he said actually happened, and more. There were other things I knew about besides things they hadn't been able to establish. It all did happen the way he said, and that means that I've simply been a puppet in somebody's hands. It doesn't really matter whose, Anastasia's or some kind of forces or energy, that's not important. What matters is that I, as a man, am nothing, I don't exist. What exists is my flesh, which is so easily controllable by someone through arranged coincidences. It would be all right if I were the only one who could be controlled, but there may very well be other people under someone's control from above, or maybe someone on high is controlling all humanity, and all humanity is just pl a plaything for an invisible someone, someone imperceptible to our human minds. I didn't want to be anyone's plaything, but the facts cited in the report argue incontestably that I am nothing. I'm being controlled. And this is clearly manifest. I can see it backed up by facts I know all too well myself. Whatever happened to me on Cyprus wasn't bad. Quite the contrary, it was good. But that's not the point. If an invisible someone has arranged a chain of wonderful coincidences, then tomorrow it may come into somebody else's head to arrange another, not-so-wonderful chain of coincidences. This is relegating man to the status of a plaything. And what about mankind as a whole? How could I not have realized before that some kind of forces are playing with all mankind, like children with toy soldiers? When Anastasia talked about God and co-creation back in the taiga, it was as though some kind of curtain had parted as a result of her words. For the first time in my life I pictured God not as some kind of amorphous, incomprehensible being or an old man sitting on a cloud, but as a person, capable of feeling, experiencing concern, dreaming, and creating. My impressions from what Anastasia told me were more vivid and more comprehensible than anything I had ever heard or read before on the subject. And that wasn't all. When she spoke, my heart felt good and not so lonely, which means he exists. He can be understood, and he acts. He is wise and good, and this is confirmed by his creation all around us the cedars, the grass, the birds, and the beasts. There in the taiga, in Anastasia's glade, they are all somehow kindly, not aggressive. We're so accustomed to taking his creations for granted. We hardly pay any attention to them, but we try to appreciate him through something else instead, through some kind of secret doctrines, and we wander the planet looking for hidden sacred places, looking for teachers, looking for teachings. Now if that isn't truly absurd, a complete absence of logic. If we talk about God as our good father, then how can we assume that he will conceal something good from his children? There is nothing he has hid or concealed from people, his children. On the contrary, he always endeavors to be right beside them. What power is it to oppo that opposes him? What power has so mesmerized us that we, through our lifestyle, have placed the whole planet, this splendid earth which he has given us, under the threat of global disaster. What power is toying with us? Every evening we see the glow emanating from the windows of our many-storied apartment blocks. Behind every window, people's lives are unfolding. And how many of them, how many of these lives are really happy in this world? We talk about mortality, love, and culture. We all try to present 
an appearance of decency, but in reality, but in reality, even by the most conservative estimate, every other man, through outwardly dis descent, is fooling around with women only on the sly, unbeknownst to his family, which still presents a decent appearance. What is one of the most lucrative sources of our national government's income? Vodka and cigarettes. The state still maintains a tight hold <clears throat> on its monopoly here. But who does the drinking? The winos lolling about our fences and apartment block lobbies? Well, of course, they drink too. But they don't have the financial clout to sustain the hundreds of our flourishing factories spewing out rivers of spirits. No, it is the outwardly decent and respectable folk who constitute the bulk of the consumer market here. We maintain huge police forces, not to mention personal security services and private investigative teams. For what? To round up all the winos and philanderers? Nonsense. With the forces at its disposal, internal affairs could go and collect them all in a single day. It's not them they're after, but outwardly decent folk. Just think, here we have a whole army of special services, and believe me, they do not sit around with time on their hands, which means there must be a whole army out there working against them. Which means that here a constant warfare is being waged, and we are all sitting right on the border between the warring parties, financing both sides. We attempt to improve the technical capabilities of one of the belligerents, namely our organs of law enforcement, yet at the same time the other side is also upgrading its own technical prowess and financing it from our pockets, too. After all, money has only one source, human labor and the war is being waged on an ever more technically advanced level. And it's not just one year or two year conflict. It's all been going on for millennia, and nobody knows where it all started or who can put an end to it. And we're right in the midst of action, and not one of us is neutral. We're all participants. We're all participants in a never-ending war. Some of us are directly involved in the fighting. Some finance it willingly or unwillingly. Others manufacture the arms for it, but we all proceed under the mask of decency, talking about science, technology, and culture. As an intensively developing, intelligent civilization, we make ourselves look smart and utter the slogans of scientific and techno technical progress. Well, you smart civilization, what about all the stinking water coming out of your taps? How did you ever think up, especially with that smart appearance of yours, this business of forcing people to buy their drinking water in bottles? Water which gets more expensive day by day. We are unwilling to take off our masks of decency, but why? Why do we inevitably complicate our lives this way year after year? Why are we moving so inexorably towards some stinking cesspool? And why are moving... And we are moving toward it, even if we don't want to admit it to ourselves. Why is nobody stopping this movement? We have religious denominations aplenty, but not one of them can stop this movement. What if they can't stop it completely, but just slow it down? If so, then that would be a form of sadism, only prolonging the period of torture. We go on thinking of ourselves as being a smart and decent civilization, but why, in this smart civilization, are women losing interest in having children? Statistics are already showing us that our nation is dying out. What kind of forces are making a complete nutcase out of man? For a whole week, I was depressed and apathetic about everything. I simply lay in bed the whole time and hardly had a bite to eat. Toward the end of the week, I was suddenly overcome by fits of anger, even rage. I felt like doing at least something to counteract these forces. It didn't matter what kind of forces they were, dark or bright, just despite anything that was, co that was trying to control us, to show them that man is capable of coming out from under their control. But what could I do to spite them? If they, or Anastasia along with them, wanted me to write, then I would refuse to write. If meat was off limits, then I'd eat meat, and smoke and drink too. Judging by their actions, they wouldn't like that. Well... Just let them try and stop me. I drank every day for a whole month. The stupor relieved me temporarily, but then came the sobriety of the following morning, 
and all the bad thoughts flared up in me once more. Why had I been writing? I was trying to be honest, while all along I was simply becoming a toy of amusement in goodness knows whose hands. At night time, after getting thoroughly drunk, I would make my way along the wall to my bed. And how I wanted to cry out, cry out so that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren could hear, so that they could hear and understand, understand. I'd been writing because I couldn't take the lie of the mask any longer. I was trying to find a way out. Chapter 21. Attempt at Deconditioning. Occasionally in the morning I would feel a desire to break free of my drunken stupor, and then I would head for the bathroom to shave off my several days' growth of stubble, remembering Anastasia. I tried not to think of bad things, but of the good she had managed to accomplish. I tried to convince myself that she was doing something good, but life kept on tossing more and more destructive arguments my way. And so, on one particular morning, as I was routinely trying to come out of my stupor, a good friend of mine rang the doorbell of the flat I was renting. It was still early, and I hadn't finished shaving yet. I still had shaving cream on my face as I opened the door. Vladislav was in some kind of emotional state. After saying hello, he announced, We gotta talk. Go finish your shaving while I start. I did so, and he began telling me that he had finally read the book. He was excited about it and could agree with Anastasia on a lot of things. He thought her logic was ironclad, but there was something else that he was even more concerned about. So, because of this meeting with her, you broke up with your family and lost your business? You don't feel like carrying on with your business anymore, eh? That's right. And you tried to organize a commonwealth of entrepreneurs with pure thought, like she suggested? So are you writing your next book? I'm not writing at the moment. There's something I'm trying to work out. That's just it. You've got to work it out. Tell me, just what have you accomplished after five years' acquaintance with this recluse? What do you have to show for yourself? What do you mean, what? I'll give you an example. Here in the Caucasuses, you can already see the first glimpses of a change in people's attitude toward the dolmens. You can imagine how many scientific papers had been written about them earlier, but they never made anyone excited about them. People just plundered them and carted things away. But what Anastasia said had an immediate effect. In just the Drusha Sanatorium alone, they had no sooner read my book than the employees got together and went to the nearby dolmen to lay flowers. And in other places, too. People are changing their attitude toward their forebears. They're thinking about... Stop! I completely agree with you. Her words are having an effect. And the fact you mentioned just now not only confirms this, but something else, too. She's turned you into a zombie. You're not really yourself anymore. What makes you think that? It's simple. You're an entrepreneur who, even back in the early days of Perestroika, was able to build up major commercial enterprises from scratch, even without any starting capital. You were the president of the Association of the Siberian Entrepreneurs, and all of a sudden you stopped doing business, and now you're doing your own washing and cooking. Hey, you're a completely different person. I've heard these arguments before, Vladislav. But what Anastasia said got me excited. She has a beautiful dream. Carry people across the dark forces window of time. She believes in it. She asked me to write a book. I promised I would. She's alone, after all, waiting and dreaming. She probably somehow associates the book with that dream of hers. You said yourself that what Anastasia says in the book can have a tremendous influence on people. That's just it. Another illustration confirming her interference in things. Judge for yourself. An unknown author, an entrepreneur, all at once writes a book. And about what? About the history of mankind, the cosmos, the mind of the universe, the raising of children. She's beginning to have an effect on people in their day-to-day -day real life. She's influencing their behavior. But it is, but it is a positive influence. 
Possibly, but that's not the point. Haven't you ever thought what made you suddenly able to write a book? Anastasia taught me. How did she do that? She took a stick and outlined the letters of the alphabet on the ground. And she said, Here are the letters which you know. All your books, both good and bad, are made up of these letters. It all depends on how and in what sequence these 33 letters are arranged. There are two ways of arranging them. So that's it? All you have to do is arrange those 33 little letters in a specific sequence? You just arrange them, and then whole groups of people will head to the mountains to lay flowers at the dolmens? That's preposterous. Too much of a stretch for an ordinary mind. It has to be the presence of some power we can't fathom yet. Whether she's zombified you, or reprogrammed you, or hypnotized you, I don't know, but she's done something. Whenever I called her a witch, or used words like mysticism, fiction, or incredible, Anastasia herself would get very upset and start claiming that she was just an ordinary human being, an ordinary woman. It was just that she had a lot of information in her. But it's only a lot by our standards. <clears throat> she says that back in the days of our pristine origins, anybody might have abilities like that. But later... And, after all, she bore me a son. And where is your son now? In the taiga with Anastasia. She says that it would be more difficult to raise a child in the conditions of our technocratic world and make him into a real man, because the little one can't comprehend artificial objects. They only lead them away from the truth. We can't show them to him until he's already assimil assimilated this truth. And why aren't you in the taiga? Why aren't you with her helping raise your son? A normal man can't live in those conditions. She's not even willing to light a fire. She's got her own way of eating. Besides, she says that I shouldn't communicate with my child for the time being. So she's not able to take it here in our normal living conditions? You can't live there? Then what's next? Ever thought about it? Here you are alone without a family. What if you fall ill? I'm not ill at the moment. I haven't had anything for well over a year now. She cured me. Does that mean you're never going to fall ill again? I'll probably get ill at some point. Anastasia said that all one's little aches and pains will try to come back again, since there's a lot of dark and harmful stuff in man, and of course in me, just like in everyone else. You see, I still smoke. I've started drinking again. But that's not the main thing. She says people don't have too many bright aspirations and thoughts, and they are the principal defense against one's aches and pains. In other words, it's unlikely you're going to have the same kind of future us normal people have. Anyway, I've come to you with a business proposal. I'll de-zombify you de-hypnotize you, and then, once you're back to a normal state, you'll be able to help me. You can help me get my firm back on track. After all, you've had experience, and you are a talented entrepreneur. You've got connections. I shan't be able to help you, Vladislav. I'm not thinking about business at the moment. My thoughts are occupied elsewhere. It's quite clear that you're not thinking at the moment. You've got to pull out of this first, get back to a normal state of mind. Just believe me, I'm asking you as a friend. You'll thank me for it by and by. After all, once you get back to a normal state, you'll be able to evaluate what's happened to your, for yourself. How can you define what is, the nor what is the most normal? It's very simple. You live a normal, natural, human life at least for a few days. You have some fun with girls, and then you take a look back at the past few years of your life. If you like what you see, you can go on working and living as you are now. But if, from a normal state of mind, you see that you are hypnotized, you can get back into business again. It'll be good for you, and you can help me. I can't go out with prostitutes. Who says anything about prostitutes? We'll take up with those who want it themselves. We'll have a party and enjoy some music and other people's company. We can have it all at a restaurant or out in nature. I'll get everything organized. All you have to do is go along. 
I need to work out things within myself first. I need to think. Come on, enough with the thinking. Look at my proposal as an experiment. I'm asking you as a friend. Just give me a week, and then you can think. Okay, let's go for it. The following day, we went by car to a neighboring town, where some nice girls, as Vladislav put it, lived. Girls he said he had known for a long time. Chapter 22 Our Reality The woman who opened the door for us was attractive and alluring. Thirty-something, feminine and shy, pleasingly plump. No, she wasn't fat. Her body preserved and even accentuated all the man-enticing curves, which were hardly obscured under the sheer gown she was wearing. Her childlike voice and welcoming smile at once made us feel at home. Hello there, travelers. Come on in, come on in. Svetlana told me about you. She said you'd like to see the town and then go to a restaurant and have a great time. That's just the ticket. We want to do all that, and of course with you, my lovelies, Vladislav blurted out. And how's my dear Svetlanka? Still out partying, eh? What? Now when would we have time to go out partying, and with who? Seems the rest of us have to wait a lifetime. Why wait? See here, I've brought a pal along. He's from Siberia, and he's 100% ent entrepreneur. She straightened her tight-woven braid and raised her timidly lowered eyes to reveal a sparkling pair of eyes that looked as though they could be full of passion and desire. She offered me her hand. I'm Lena. Hello. Vladimir, I introduced myself, shaking her cream puff hand. While Lena got some coffee ready for us in the kitchen, Vladislav and I washed up and then took a look around her two-room apartment. I really liked her flat. The layout was pretty much like any other flat, but hers looked especially clean and cozy, well cared for. Everything was arranged in place, no clutter. The bedroom featured turquoise flowered wallpaper and matching curtains with frills. This color, also picked up by the rug and the counterpane on what looked like close to a king-size bed, together with the tidiness of the room, had a soothing effect. The bed especially was truly inviting. We sat ourselves down in comfortable armchairs in the other room, which was a, a little bigger. Vladislav switched on a rather expensive-looking tape player and asked me, Well, what do you think of her? Jolly good. I'm just wondering how come she's not married. How come millions of other women aren't married? Haven't you heard? There's not enough of us. Men, that is, to go around. Sure, I ha I've heard it, but she's not just everyone. She's really nice, and she's managed to make a cozy nest for herself here. Yes, she has. She gets a decent salary. She's a top hairdresser. Not just a hairdresser, a stylist to boot. She goes in for competitions. And as for her clientele, let's just say she has more than one wealthy lady waiting to pay good money for her services. Do you think she sleeps around? No way. Svetka and that, back when they were in school together, Lenka took up with this dimwit from the next class up. Then, after they finished school, she dumped him, but he kept after her for the longest time and picked a fight with anyone who tried to go out with her. There were quite a few lads he and his pals left in a pretty bad way, right before her eyes. He even got hauled up on delinquency charges. She felt sorry for him and never testified against him. She always claimed she wasn't fully conscious and couldn't remember. So they were only able to get him once for beating up on some lad who had a high place daddy. And then maybe she's frigid? Maybe she doesn't need a man? Frigid? I should say not. Didn't you notice the way she looked at you with those eyes of hers? Like a boa constrictor sizing up a rabbit. She was ready to jump into bed with you right off. Don't exaggerate. Now don't you go your fault finding. Just enjoy yourself. Carpe diem. We agreed we're going to relax and have a good time. So let's just relax and have a good time. 
Lena brought cups of coffee on a beautiful tray. She had changed into a body-hugging sundress and had put on a bit of makeup. Looking even better than before, she suggested. If you're hungry, I can throw something together. No, replied Vladislav. We'll eat at, at a restaurant. Ring up one of the better places here and reserve a table for four. While we sat and drank our coffee, Lena telephoned a restaurant and reserved a table with some manager she apparently knew quite well. As she used the familiar form of address, instructing him, try to find a good spot. I'm coming with some very nice gentlemen. That evening, Lena took us on a ride in her car to see the sights of the city and its environs, ending up at the restaurant. An obliging doorman in a richly adorned uniform opened the door for us with a gallant sweep of his hand. The maitre d' escorted us to a table on the far side of the dining room. It was indeed a night's nice spot on a slightly raised floor with a good view of the whole restaurant and the stage. The dining room, with its beautiful plaster moldings on the walls and ceilings indicating a rather expensive establishment, was already almost filled to capacity. Probably only the wealthy could afford to enjoy a meal here. We decided we would hold nothing back. We ordered the most expensive hors d'oeuvres, some good wine, and a bottle of vodka for me. The orchestra struck up a dance tune, some kind of tango. Vladislav immediately suggested we all take the dance floor, and we started off. Lena's womanly body swayed cozily and comfortably in my arms. Already a wee bit tipsy, I was even more intoxicated by the fragrance of her perfume, not to mention those sparkling eyes of hers. Her lowered eyelids lifted from time to time to reveal a tender gaze burning as it seemed in anticipation of forthcoming passion. And then they lowered once more as though embarrassed all of a sudden. By the time we got back to our table, all my sense of being a seeker on the straight and narrow vanished out the window. I felt good and lightheaded, and I was grateful to Vladislav and Lena and everything in general. So it was possible to live a good life, as long as one didn't dig into it too deep, but simply enjoy its benefits. I poured everyone a glass of wine, vodka for myself. I was just about to propose a toast when Vladislav interrupted. After dancing with his Svetlana, he looked very nervous for some reason. He immediately lit a cigarette, carelessly dropping the ashes onto his salad. Without waiting for anyone else, he took a large gulp of wine and didn't say a word, only fidgeted in his chair. I was in the point of picking up my glass and proposing my toast when he started muttering, Wait, something's come up, something serious. Let's step out for a bit. We gotta talk. And without waiting for my reply, he rose sharply from his seat. You birds stay here and swap a bit of gossip. We'll be right back. We went out into the spacious restaurant lobby. Vladislav beckoned me over to the far corner of the fountain in a sour, muffled voice spat out, She's a bitch. You were right. A damned bitch. Who's a bitch? If, you ha if you've had a falling out with Svetka, then don't spoil the evening for others. Not Svetka. Lenka set us up, or rather set you up. Though I'm, not, I'm in for it, too. I'm going to stick with you. Do you mind telling me just how she could set me up or set us up? Who or what for? Svetka told me while we were dancing. I'd been telling her all about you, and she felt sorry for you. As soon as she saw you, and while we were dancing, she told me the whole story. What story? Lenka's a bitch, some kind of sick masochist, a pervert. You can see how men fall for her. She flirts with them, and then she takes them to this restaurant. She invariably gets a table reserved through her friend there, and that lackey right off contacts this mafia bloke. What mafia bloke? That dimwit over there, the one she's got to know in, the sc in school. I was telling you how even when he was younger, he and his chums would beat up on anyone taking her out. And now, he's making like a kind of local gang boss, running some sort of racket. Anyway, she knows that as soon as she asks for a certain table through her pal there, he'll automatically contact this mafia bloke. And right here in the restaurant, or more often afterwards in some secluded spot, he'll lie in what, in wait with his thugs and beat Lenka's companion half to death. 
The whole business is supposed to take place right before her eyes. She gets a real high from it, maybe even starts to come. Svetka says it's already a disease with her. She once admits to Svetka that these scenarios can even sometimes give her an orgasm. And the dimwit? What does he get out of it? Who knows what he does it for? Maybe he loves her like he did before. Maybe he too gets some perverse pleasure from it. Svetka says Lena pretends she's out of it, and then, after the scene's over, he takes her home and spends the night with her, and goodness knows what they do there in her flat. So why doesn't he just go ahead and marry her? What difference does it make to you why they don't get married? I tell you, it's like Lenka's sick. She doesn't want to let go of her youth. You get married, and all you've got is humdrum everyday life. <clears throat> this way she gets her high. But what high would she get in married life? She's sick, Svetka says. What's it to us? We gotta think of ourselves. How to get out of this now? Let's just leave the restaurant, since you say they might contact the, that mafia jerk. Too late. He's already here with his henchmen. Watching us. Svetka says the first thing he'll do is come over to our table, and very politely ask to have a dance with Lenka. If her companion says okay, they'll have a dance. Otherwise, he'll calmly walk away. But it all ends up the same. They'll lie in wait and then beat him half to death. If there's any valuables, his henchmen will grab them. I've already given my Rolex to Svetka. If you've got anything like that, let me give it to her too for safekeeping. I don't have any valuables. Tell me, how come they're not afraid of the cops? Listen, I tell you, they've got it all set it up. He's got a lawyer... Not only that, but they can make the whole situation look like they were protecting the woman from from a rapist. And that means Lena won't testify. She'll shut up, the bitch, fake a memory lapse like she was in shock and had a fainting spell. It's all my fault. We've landed in this pile of crap, but I think I have an idea. I've got an idea. Let's pretend to start something. Pick a fight. Get into a row with each other so the police will come and take us away. Better spend a night in the drunk tank and pay a fine, then end up scarred for life. No, no way. I'm not going to punish myself for their sakes. Can't we go through the back door? Then you could ring up Svetka, order a taxi to go and collect her? We shan't make it. They're already sitting out there. If we leave, they'll only come after us and bring us back. We'll get it doubly hard in that case. And then they'll claim we were trying to run off without paying our bill. If there's no escape... Then let's go all out. Sky's the limit. At least play on the nerves of those these bastards. It's a shame the evening's spoiled. I was having such a good time. How are we going to go all out? Tell me how. We'll go and get really spa soused. Then we shan't have a care in the world. Let's pull out all the stops while we still can. Only don't let that... Don't let on that you know. Don't get nervous in the meantime. What do you mean? I'm not afraid for myself. I'm worried about you. Let's go. We returned to our table. The spacious and luxurious restaurant sparkled with the grandeur of ladies' refined attire, and the jewels adorning them were, to all appearances, genuine. A lot of the still very young, beautiful girls, in the company of their suave escorts, also sported fancy jewelry. These were so-called new Russians, out for a good time. But they are Russian, are Russia too. Which meant that here was Russia herself out for a good time in a way she alone was capable of, with, dar with daring and pizzazz. And the pizzazz will most certainly show itself in due time, even if for now everything is done with decorous grandeur and luxury. As soon as we sat down at our table, I filled our wine glasses to the brim and proposed a toast. Here's to satisfaction. Let each of us sitting here tonight bring at least a moment's satisfaction to those around us. To satisfaction. Vladislav and I emptied our glasses while the women drank half of theirs. I edged my chair right up to Lenka's, put my arms around her right away, rested my hand on her half-exposed cleavage and whispered in her ear, you're beautiful and cute, Lena. You'd make a terrific wife and mother. 
Initially feigning embarrassment at my embrace and my hand upon her breast, she made an attempt to withdraw, but not a serious attempt. On the contrary, she began inclining her head toward me. Thus the game was afoot, playing by their or her rules, and I played along as best as I could, without really thinking about why I was doing it, as though rushing headlong ever closer to a sad result for someone's or some dark forces sport. And the result came. From a table beside the stage rose a stout-looking fellow with a neck like a bull's. He stood there for some time, staring at us. Directly the music began. He buttoned his jacket and confidently strode over to our party's table. But halfway across the floor he suddenly stopped, began to stare just as hard in the opposite direction. And throughout the room many heads turned in the same direction. A number of couples even got up from their chairs in astonishment. I too followed their gaze and nearly fainted from shock. There, making her way from the main entrance to the stage, was none other than Anastasia, and not a single person could be left unastonished at her sprightly, I would have to say defiantly sprightly, step, not to mention her outfit. And what an outfit it was! She was still wearing her old but clean cardigan, skirt, and mother's kerchief, but at this time they looked as though they were the world's most celebrated fashion designer had come up with a super ensemble, especially for her, outshining all the other women's attire that had seemed to me so refined and fashionable up till now. Perhaps it seemed that way on account of the fact that her usual clothing was supplemented by some rather unusual jewelry, or perhaps it was her posture or the manner in which she carried herself. From Anastasia's earlobes hung, as though clipped on, two little green twigs with fur-like needles. Her head was encircled by a garland of grasses woven into a braid, keeping in place a thick golden shock of hair. Over her forehead a little flower, burning bright as a ruby, had been woven into the band, and she was wearing makeup. There was just a tint of green shadow above her eyelids. She had on the same skirt as before, but with a slit almost to her thigh. Around her waist was a belt made from a kerchief and tied with a knot. The incredible ensemble was topped off with an extraordinary, super-fashionable purse, into which she had transformed her bud bundling cloth. Folding the cloth in half, she had tied two of the corners to one end of a bark-covered stick and the other two corners to the other end, and then used a little grass belt she had woven to fasten it all together into a kind of hippie-style handbag. And to top it all off, she strode with a freedom and confidence that models and supermodels could only dream of. Upon reaching the dance floor, where a few couples were launching into some kind of quick-paced dance, Anastasia all at once spun gaily around several times in time with the music, whereby every limb of her supple body bent and twist with beautiful fluid movements. Then she arched her arms over her head and clapped her hands with a delightful laugh, and all the men in the room responded with an enthusiastic applause. As then she headed for our table, Two alert waiters approached her inquiringly, and I could see her gesturing in our direction. One of them picked up an elaborately carved wooden chair and followed her. As she walked past Lenka's friend with the bull neck who had been about to head over to our table, Anastasia paused for a bit and looked him straight in the eye. It almost seemed as though she gave him a wink before heading over to us. There I was, sitting with my arm around Lena, watching the proceedings with open-mouthed astonishment. None of us were talking, only staring. Anastasia approached our table as though nothing unusual had happened and greeted us as though she were an expected guest. Hello, and good evening. Hello, Vladimir. If you will allow me, you will not mind if I join you for a bit. No, of course not, Anastasia. Do sit down. I began recovering from the shock of her arrival. I rose to offer her my seat, but the obliging waiter had already put the additional chair in place. The second waiter moved my plate to one side and, s 
and setting a clean plate in front of Anastasia, offered her a menu. Thank you, she responded, but I am not hungry at the moment. Reaching into her hippie-style purse, she brought out a cluster of berries wrapped in a large leaf, huckleberries and cranberries. Putting them on a plate in the middle of the table, she invited us to help ourselves. How did you happen to show up here all of a sudden, Anastasia? I asked. Have you been taking in the restaurant scene lately? I came to visit you, Vladimir. I had a feeling I would find you here, so I decided to come. I am not imposing on you. You're not imposing at all. Only what's with the fancy get-up and the makeup? At first I did not have any makeup or fancy clothes, but then I tried to enter the restaurant. The doorman would not let me in. He let others in and bowed to them and held the door open for them, but he told me, Out of here, sister. This ain't your local greasy spoon. I stepped aside to a more shaded place and watched to see how others managed to get in. I realized they were wearing different attire and did not walk the same way I did. I caught on to it all quite quickly. I found two twigs handy that had fallen from a nearby tree, split them with the ends of my nails, and attached them to my ears as decoration. Look! Whereupon Anastasia turned sideways to show me her invention. What do you think? Did they turn out well? Very well, indeed. So I quickly made myself a purse and a belt out of my kerchief and some makeup from leaf and flower sap. Pity, though, I had to tear a slit in my skirt. You didn't have to make such a huge tear, practically to your thigh. Just to your knee, that would have been enough. I wanted everything to be as perfect as possible so they would let me in. And where did you get the lipstick? That's real lipstick you're wearing. I obtained it here. When the man at the entrance opened the door for me, I went over to the mirror in the lobby to see how I looked. Naturally, I was curious. There were some women standing in front of the mirror looking at me. One of them came over all excited and asked me where I got my outfit from. She offered me to do a full swap. She said she would give me her ring and costume jewelry. She even offered me some greenbacks. I explained to her that it would not take her long to put together a dress like this on her own. I started by showing her the clip-on twigs. The other woman looked on, and one asking, one of them kept on saying, Oh, wow! Oh, wow! Another started asking me where she could find magazine pictures and descriptions of such fashions. And the first one said that if I wanted to turn tricks here, she was the madame and wouldn't allow any pimps since her girls are free agents and she's quite capable of smashing any protection racket. That must have been Anka Putanka, said Svet Sveta. She's one tough cookie. They're really afraid of her. If anyone crosses her, she can come up with all kinds of schemes and arrange an incident where so many heads will be banged together. They're really they'll really be sorry. One tough cookie, Anastasia echoed m moodily, but her eyes are full of sadness. I feel sorry for her. I wanted to do at least something for her. When she started to sniff me over and ask about my perfume, I gave her a little twig containing the essence of cedar oil and showed her how to apply it. She once daubed it on herself and on her girlfriends, and in return she gave me some lipstick and a pencil to highlight the edges. I could not get it right at first, and we had a good laugh over it. Then she helped me put it on and said any time I need anything I could come to her. She offered to have me join them at their table, but I said I had only come to see my... Anastasia paused in mid-sentence, then continued after a moment's thought. To see you, Vladimir, and the rest of you. Vladimir, could we take a little walk outside? There is a breeze blowing off the sea. The air is better there. Or would you like to stay here a while longer with your friends? I can wait until you have finished. Or I... Are you certain I am not imposing? Not at all, Anastasia, I replied. I'm really happy you came. It's just that I was so surprised to see you at first. Indeed. So, perhaps you and I could take a stroll by the sea, just the two of us, or all together? Which would you prefer? Let's go, Anastasia. Just the two of us. But getting out of here wasn't all that easy. Elena's friend was heading our way. He, too, it seemed, took a while to recover from the unexpected arrival of Anastasia. 
We should have left earlier, right off, I thought to myself, but now it was too late. They had already set their dastardly scenario in motion, and Elena, as though letting herself me getting herself mentally prepared for it, began sitting up straight, lowered her eyes, and made a show of smoothing out her hair. He came over to our table, but instead of approaching Elena, he went directly to Anastasia. With a slight bow of his head, he began addressing her, taking no notice of anyone else. Elena's jaw dropped in surprise at hearing him ask Anastasia, "'Miss, allow me the pleasure of asking you for this dance.' Anastasia rose, smiled, and responded, "'Thank you, thank you so kindly for the invitation. Please have a seat in my chair.' They will miss your company otherwise. As for me, I really do not care to dance at the moment. My my gentleman friend and I have just decided we would like to go for a walk in the fresh air. In obedience to her suggestion, he sat down in the chair, not taking his eyes off her for a moment. Anastasia and I headed for the exit. My plan was to get as far away from the restaurant as possible. Go for a bit of a walk as Anastasia wanted, then grab a taxi and go back to my flat. It was it was around ten o'clock at night. We walked through a shady alley and then down to the rocky she seashore. We hadn't yet reached the water's edge when I heard the screech of brakes. I turned around to look. From a jeep parked on the other side of the road up above, five tough-looking lads were heading in our direction. As four of them encircled us, I recognized the fifth as the dimwit with the bull neck. He took up a position just a little distance away, but it was he who kicked off the conversation. Hey, pal, you'd better get back to the pub. Your lady's missing you. With no response from me, he started up again. Hey, you deaf or what? We say you'd better get back to your lady, but you got this lady mixed up with another and split. We're going to help you back, right this instant. The oversized lad standing nearest to me took a step closer, and I made a decision. Run, Anastasia, I cried, and decided to let him have it first and keep them at bay as long as I could, could so that Anastasia could get away. I tried to land the first blow on the chap approaching me, but he seized hold of my arm, punched me in the solar plexus, and then wham, right in the face. I tumbled to the ground right on the rocks. I would probably have landed on my head, but Anastasia reached out her hand and cushioned my fall. My head was spinning and I could hardly breathe. I lay there and watched the big fellow's feet, shod in steel ra rain force boots, reinforced boots, come right up to my face. Uh-oh, he's going to use his foot on me next. The thought flashed through my mind. Now he came really close and lifted his leg. Only right at that point, Anastasia did just about what any woman would have done under the circumstances. She screamed. But what a scream! It was a regular scream, only for a split second. The sound associated with it quickly vanished, and her inaudible scream rose wildly in intensity to the point of shattering one's eardrum. I could see the lads around us letting some kind of objects fall from their hands as they grabbed hold of their ears. Three of them collapsed to the ground and began writhing on their knees in pain. Anastasia, having covered my ears with her own hands, kept refilling her lungs with fresh breaths of air and screaming again. Her scream was evidently something akin to ultrasound, causing all of the would-be attackers to writhe in pain. They had no idea what was happening or where this piercing, unbearable sound was coming from. Through her hands, I could feel the sharp, penetrating sensation— Maybe not as strongly as the others, but it still hurt. Then I noticed a group of women running down toward us from the road. Anastasia stopped screaming and took her hands off my ears. I sat up on a rock. I could see the two zigilis the girls had arrived in standing beside the jeep. The women were armed. One was carrying a bottle, another a tire iron, a third brandished a policeman's truchin while the fourth held a massive candlestick in her hands. 
Out in front was Anka Putanka holding in her hands the neck of a broken champagne bottle, while following behind slowly came yet another, a plumpish woman clad only in a nightgown who had apparently come straight out of bed and hadn't had time to get dressed. Somehow the madam in charge had managed to sound the alarm and rope all her, all her workmates into the task at hand. The fearsome, disheveled Anka stopped just a few meters from our little group, which was now picturesquely sprawled over, out over the rocks. Anastasia was the only one of us standing, and Anka spoke to her. How now, friend? You've got so many lads after you. They wouldn't be bothering you, would they now? I just wanted to have a talk with one of them, Anastasia calmly replied. And the rest of them, what are they doing down here? They followed us for some reason. I have no idea what they want. You have no idea? I know what those scumbags want replied Anka with, and burst into a torrent of ex, expletives of the, in, the, in the direction of Lena's friend. How many times have I told you, muttonhead, not to lay a hand on me girls? She isn't one of yours, the dimwit responded gruffly. She's my professional colleague. That means she's mine. Got it, you overgrown school kid? If I see your pimp snout so much as anywhere near one of my one of me friends, I'll smash the living daylights out of you and your cronies. Just remember that. I'm not putting up with a single pimp on my territory. Not a single scumbag will I allow. You're not satisfied with sucking blood from the suits? You want to be pimping for us too? You've gone crazy. She's not yours. She's a novice. I just wanted to have some fun with her myself. This time, Anka, you've gone too far. What's all this fuss about her? What's she to you? She's me friend, got that? And you got your hands full with that sadist of yours. You've gone bonkers. Before you know it, every last bird's gonna be your friend. Eh, what? The leader's voice in him was now, was no longer stifled by fear. And I realized why. While Anka was talking with him, his henchmen had come to, and the short, stocky fellow standing beside the leader was holding a gun in his hand, aimed right at Anka. A second man had his own gun trained on the group of hookers standing behind her. Here was this group of young women armed with whatever they could lay their hands on, standing directly in the path of, of the thugs' guns. The situation, as it now turned out, was far from being in their favor. One thing was absolutely certain. Another moment and their moral would be broken and their bodies maimed, not to mention the loss of their freedom and income. I really felt like doing at least something to influence the proceedings and head off in the inevitable dreaded result. Anastasia was standing beside me, intently observing the situation. I jerked her arm, putting my hands over my ears, and quickly, I quickly said, Scream, Anastasia, scream as quick as you can. Lowering my arm, she inquired, Why scream, Vladimir? Eh, don't you see what's going on? These women are about to get their heads bashed and maimed for life. Their bluff's been called. It's all over for them. Not for all of them. The spirit is still fighting in three of them. But what can the spirit do against guns? They're done for. They're not done for yet, Vladimir. As long as their spirit is still fighting, nobody should interfere. Outside interference may take care of the situation at hand, but it will weaken their self-confidence and mean that a whole lot of other situations in their lives will not turn out favorably for them. They will come to rely on outside help. Stuff that philosophy of yours, at least for now. Can't you see the situation's hopeless? I fell silent. It was clear Anastasia's mind was made up. And I thought wistfully, oh, if only I could scream like that. I see his cronies ready and alert. Lena's boyfriend, the pimp, spoke up. It was clear from the tone of his voice that he was already feeling. He had the situation well in hand. I told you, Anka Putanka, you've gone too far. But this time we've won, so you better drop your toys, you little tarts. Drop them and get those rags off. We're going to screw all of you one at a time. Anka looked around at the thugs standing or concealing themselves, guns at the ready, and answered with a sigh. 
Maybe you don't need all of us. Maybe just me's enough. Ha <laughs> ha, bitch. See, now you're singing a different tune, the leader responded over the laughter of his buddies. We shan't be satisfied with just, just with you. We're going to teach you all a lesson here. After this, you're going to be working for us, bitches. And just where are you going to get the stud power to take on all of us? Anka responded with a laugh. You'll be lucky if you have enough for just one. Shut your trap, bitch. We'll screw all of you several times over. I doubt that. I bet you won't be able to take on even one of us. We'll keep screwing you all night long. You know, sweet cheeks, you're starting to get on my nerves. Your, you and your promises, I don't believe them. I don't believe you're man enough. You'll find out soon enough, bitch. I'm going to smash that pretty face of yours in, wheezed the leader, already seething with rage, putting on a pair of brass knuckles as he moved towards Anka. Anka retreated a bit and called out to her group, Step aside, girls. The group of hookers took several steps back. Only the sullen, plumpish cow in the nightdress stood on the sidelines as though rooted in the spot. And when the tall and lanky leader took another step in Anka's direction, the cow, who before this had not spoken a word, suddenly said blandly, Hey, An, what are you waiting for, An? Let's get started, eh? Don't be in such a hurry, Mashka, replied Anka, taking another couple of steps back. Well, go ahead, seeing you're itching to get on with it. The plumpish Mashka, Masha calmly and coquettishly tore open the flaps of her nightdress, scattering the buttons to the winds, exposing not only her bare breasts and bikini briefs, but something else as well. Under the, her nightgown, the cow was carrying a Kalanishkov assault rifle with a silencer and night vision telescope sight. She pulled the bolt, raised the butt stock to her shoulder, pressed the cheek to her to the stock, and peered into the sight. Only remember, Masha, no automatic, Anka suggested. This ain't no war zone. Just one bullet at a time. You know, every bullet costs money. Uh-huh, answered Masha, her eyes still pressed to the sight and fired off five shots, each about a second apart. But what shots they were! The, full, the first bullet tore off the heel from one of the leader's boots, apparently wounding his foot in the process. He jumped back in the direction of the water, limping. The other four shots landed right by each of the thugs in turn. Immediately they began looking for cover behind the rocks and the ones who didn't have any cover handy lay face down on the ground. And tell them to crawl into the water, or they may get blasted by a ricochet, Masha blurted out, her Kalishnikov still at the ready. You heard her, sweet cheeks. Into the water, Anka ordered the big thugs already crawling toward the water's edge, gently reminding them, Mashenka's not yet a good enough shot to be responsible for ricocheting bullets. A moment later, and all of them, including their leader, were standing waist-deep in the sea. Anya went up to Anastasia, and for a while the two simply looked at each other, face to face, without saying a word. Then Anya said quietly, with just a hint of sadness, You, friend, wanted to go for a stroll with your companion there, so go ahead. It's a fine evening, quiet, warm... Yes, there is indeed a pleasant air blowing over the city, Anastasia replied, adding, You are tired, Anya. Perhaps you would care to relax in a garden of your own. Perhaps, but I feel sorry for me girls, and I'm still so mad at those blokes. Say, are you from the country? Yes. Nice place where you live? Very nice. But I do not always feel at peace, especially when things are not going well for everyone in other places, as here right now. Don't mind them. Come whenever you like. Anyway, I'm off. Gotta work. Have a nice, quiet stroll here. Anya headed toward the cars, her entourage in tow, as they walked past the cow still sitting on the rock. 
the Kalashnikov lying across her bare knees. Anya said, You stay and relax here a bit, Mashenka. We'll send a car for you later. I've got a client waiting. I was with him when you called me, and he's paid already. We'll take care of your client. We'll say you had an upset stomach. Like, the quality of the champagne wasn't up to scratch. I had vodka, and only half a glass. Well, then maybe something you ate. I didn't have anything to eat, just a bit of candy and some pastries. So that's it, then. The pastries weren't too fresh. How many did you eat? Don't remember. Come on, she never eats less than four at a time, said one of the girls. Right, Masha? Well, maybe you're right. At least leave me a cigarette, so as I don't get bored out of my skull. Anya put a package of cigarettes along with a lighter on the rock beside Masha, and the girls walked on. Hey, came a voice from the water. You gonna leave this gal of yours here on the rocks? She's staying, sweet cheeks. She's staying, replied Anya. I told you right off, one of us is enough for the likes, the likes of you. You wanted all of us, and now it turns out it's going to be pretty boring for just one of us to stay here with you. Once this gets out, about how conniving you are, one of the thugs called out, once it gets out, well, no one will ever want to shag with you again, even if you offered to pay them. Five muffled shots rang out from the rock in a quick succession, and five little splashes popped up in the water, one right beside each of the men standing there, making them retreat even further out from the shore. Anya turned to them and warned, Look, boys, just make sure you don't rile Mashenka here. When we like someone, we can be sweet and tender, and loyal as dogs. When we like someone, understand? no matter who. And then, as she clambered up the hill toward the car, she struck up a song in a resonant, wistful voice. The paths and roads are all overgrown there, which my dear lover's feet have known there. And the young prostitutes following her picked up on the tone of her voice, on the intonations of sadness and despair. Overgrown there with mosses and grasses, He's taken up with another of the lasses. Where does he travel, my lover? It makes my heart only sorrow and suffer. And off they drove, still singing the song about the pathways and roads, as they headed back to work. Chapter 23 Your Desires it was almost midnight by the time Anastasia and I got back to my apartment. As I put the key into the lock, I felt a sense of exhaustion after all the intense experiences the day had brought. Upon seeing my bed, I told Anastasia that I was extremely tired and went to take a shower. When I came out of the shower, Anastasia told me she had already made up my bed and that she herself would lie down on the balcony. It's probably too stuffy for her in one of these mass-produced apartment blocks, I thought, and went out to the balcony to see what kind of bed she had made for herself there. It turned out she had put a little strip of rug down on the balcony floor and covered it with some white paper which my landlord had got ready for wallpapering the flat. In place of a pillow, she had folded her cardigan and put a small tree branch at the head of her makeshift bed. How can you get a good night's sleep here, Anastasia? It's hard and you'll be cold. At least let me fetch you a blanket. Not to worry, Vladimir. I shall be fine here. The air is fresh and I can see the stars. Look up and see how many stars there are. There is a soft, warm breeze blowing. I shall not be cold. You go lie down, Vladimir, and I shall sit on the edge of your bed for a while. And once you fall asleep, I shall lie down too. I lay down on the bed Anastasia had made up for me, and thought I was so tired that I'd nod off right away. But it didn't work out quite like that. The thought or realization that man, i.e. every single individual, was nothing more than a plaything in the hands of some sort of coincidences, kept gnawing away at my mind, 
giving me no peace. This led to a growing feeling of irritation at those who had arranged these coincidences. And Anastasia too, Anastasia in particular, since I considered it a definite possibility that she had actually participated in the formation of these coincidences, at least as far as my life was concerned. Is something disturbing you, Vladimir? Anastasia calmly inquired, and I raised myself slightly on my elbows. As if you didn't know, I believed you. I wanted to believe. I particularly wanted to believe that man, every man, is capable of making his own life happy. I especially believed in the echo communities you talked about, where people can live a secure existence thanks to their own family plot of land, and raise their children to have a happy life, and that there would be good schools there for the children. I believed you when you said that every man is beloved is, a, is the beloved child of God. Man is the summit of creation. You did say that, didn't you? Yes, Vladimir, I did tell you that. Of course you did, and how convincing you made it all sound. I not only believed you, I started acting on it, started organizing a community. I've already submitted the necessary paperwork to the authorities. The Anastasia Foundation is collecting people's applications. The design's been commissioned along with a layout for gardens and all sorts of plantings. It would have been all right just to believe you and all that, but I actually started carrying things out, and with pleasure. You knew. You knew I'd carry things out. Yes, Vladimir, I knew. After all, you are an entrepreneur. You are always ready to carry out practical actions to make things happen. Always ready, I echoed. How simple it all is. Of course, no need to be a clairvoyant to see that. As long as an entrepreneur believes in something, he will start to act. And I, fool that I was, started too. I couldn't stay lying down any longer. I jumped out of bed, walked over to the window, and opened the fortocha, since I felt a sudden wave of heat, either in the room or within me. Why did you think your actions foolish, Vladimir? Anastasia calmly asked. Her equanimity, along with her feigned ignorance, as I then considered it, made me even more angry. And you just sit there talking all calm and collected like calm and collected, as if you didn't know all along that man is a puppet in somebody's hands. They control man through various circumstances. Each man is easily controllable by some kind of forces. If they feel like it, they can plunge half the human race into war. They plunge people into war and then take up a position somewhere up above or on the sidelines to watch us kill each other. If they feel like it, they'll slip some sort of religion into the proceedings and watch, once again, as people go to war over their faith. If they feel like it, they can play with just a single individual. I'm convinced of it. I've been convinced by people who are smart enough to analyze what's going on. And just how do these smart people succeed in convincing you that man is just a plaything in the hands of some kinds of forces? I listened to a report. They were talking about me. Some smart people became interested in public reaction to the books. They became interested in you and in me too. They followed my every move during my time on Cyprus while I was working on the fourth book. They recorded everything and then analyzed it. And if you can believe it, I'm not mad at them for following me. I'm even grateful to them for finally opening my eyes. They showed me how man is being toyed with. Coincidences just don't just happen. They're arranged. I've become convinced of this through my own experience. What experience is this, Vladimir? Have you been conducing an experiment? I have, but they've been conducting an experiment on me. When I was on Cyprus, I happened to mention freshwater fish, and presto, freshwater fish appeared. I mentioned cedars, and cedars appeared. I wanted to pay a nighttime visit to a church, and lo and behold, there was a church. 
and the church doors were open at night. A whole lot of other things happened. All I had to do, no doubt, was write that they write what they wanted me to. But the main thing, the granddaughter of the goddess Aphrodite appeared. I mentioned to several people on Cyprus that I wanted to meet with her granddaughter, since I had had it up to here with their Aphrodite. There were posters everywhere about her baths, and people were forever carrying on about her. Anyway, I told them I was going to meet the granddaughter of the goddess of Aphrodite. I mentioned this, and a few days later, along comes this girl with fire in her eyes. Anyway, the things turned out. Everybody decided that Aphrodite had indeed sent her granddaughter, and was working miracles through this girl and the girl herself underwent some kind of transformation. But who arranged all these circumstances one after another? Who? I certainly didn't arrange anything. If only one thing like this happened to take place, well, okay, but here was a whole chain of them together. And if you take them all together, it's no longer a coincidence. It's a pattern. This is the conclusion the academics came to. And I'm convinced they're right, and you can't persuade me otherwise. But I was not about to deny that there is a pattern to what has been happening, Vladimir, Anastasia calmly observed. I felt my whole insides turn cold, and I was suddenly overwhelmed with, an, with some kind of extraordinary sense of apathy following these last words of Anastasia's. I did have a hope, a faint one but still a hope that she would be able to dissolve the whole feeling that had been building up in me of man's utter insignificance. Not just my insignificance, but all mankind's. But this she didn't do. In any case, how could she have? Who would dare deny what is so patently obvious, indifferent to any, everyone and everything, I stood by the window in a room lit only by moonlit moonlight and looked out at the stars. Somewhere out there, perhaps on one of those very stars, lived those who were controlling us, toying with us. They were living. They were real. But could our existence really be called life? A toy in subjection to somebody will cannot be said to live an independent life which meant only one thing we were not living this is why we are indifferent to so many things once again Anastasia began talking in that same quiet and calm voice but this time her voice didn't arouse in me any emotions whatsoever it was more like some kind of ex extraneous sound Vladimir you and the people who sent you that cassette with the report were right. There really are energies out there capable of changing time, joining together into a single chain various events, or, as happened with you, arranging a chain of circumstances required to achieve a predetermined goal. Pure coincidences do not happen. That is already clear to many people. Coincidences, even those which seem to be the most far-fetched, are programmed. Everything that happens to each individual is programmed. And what happened to you on Cyprus, which served as a clear illustration for the researchers as well as naturally for you, was also programmed, and then turned into reality. Tell me, please, Vladimir, would you not like to know where the one directly responsible for programming your coincidences is now? What difference does it make where he is? Doesn't matter to me, on Mars, the moon, whether he feels good or bad. He, he is right here in this room, Vladimir. That means it's you? If so, that still doesn't change anything. I'm not even surprised. And I'm not angry. I simply don't care. We are manipulable. And that's the hopeless tragedy of the human race. I am not the one in charge of programming your coincidences, Vladimir. I am able to exercise but a tiny speck of influence. Then who is in charge? 
There's only two of us in this room. Or is there a third, a programmer, who's invisible? Vladimir, this programmer is right within you. It is your desires. How so? Only man's desires and aspirations can launch any kind of program of action. This is the law of the Creator. Nobody, none of the energies of the universe can ever break that law. Because man is the master of all the energies of the universe. Man. But I didn't launch anything on Cyprus, Anastasia. Everything happened all by itself, by coincidence, apart from me. There were indeed, indeed certain minor incidents that were not part of the more significant events, though they contributed to their realization. And these incidents did happen apart from your will. But the basic events themselves were preceded by your desires. Was it not you who wanted to meet with the granddaughter of the goddess Aphrodite? You expressed your wish in the presence of witnesses and repeated it a number of times. Yes, I did. And if you remember that, then how can you call servants carrying out the will of their lord masters? And how can you call the master a plaything in their hands? Yes, that would be silly. Interesting how all this is turning out. Wow, desires? But why then aren't all our desires fulfilled? Many people wish for things, but their wishes aren't fulfilled. So much depends on how meaningful the goal is, on whether the desire corresponds to the light or the dark, on how strong the desire is. The more substantial and bright the goal, the more the forces of light are drawn to fulfill it, to bring it about. And if the goal is a dark one, let's say, for example, to get drunk, or to get into a fight, or plan a war, then the dark forces take over. Man, through his desire, has given the, them the opportunity to act. But as you can see, it is still man's desire that is first and foremost. Your desire, Vladimir. I began to ponder what Anastasia had said, and my heart felt better and better. The very pleasant moonlight filled the whole room, and it seemed as though the stars in the sky were shining not with a cold light, but with a warm one. And Anastasia, sitting there on the edge of the bed, seemed to look even better than before. I said to her, You know, Anastasia, back there when I first arrived on Cyprus, to be honest with you, I very nearly went on a binge, because at first I couldn't find anything there I liked. Nobody spoke Russian. It was too noisy to work. People were whooping it up all around. Why on earth did I end up here, I thought? Maybe to get to know some hookers? There are lots of women there, shall we say, of loose behavior. From both Russia and Bulgaria. You see, Vladimir? You had the desire, and there they were. You got drunk on vodka and set up a date with them with one woman from Bulgaria and another from Russia. Only even before that you wanted to meet with Aphrodite's granddaughter. Your first desire proved to be stronger, and she appeared and saved you from all the wretched stuff. She helped you. Yes, she did. And just how m might you know about the Bulgarian girl? From my feelings, Vladimir. I don't understand that, but never mind. Tell me rather, this girl, Elena Fadievya, she's not the daughter of the goddess Aphrodite. She's Russian. She's simply an employee of the tourist agency on Cyprus. But I was talking about Aphrodite's granddaughter. Does that mean these forces of light were too puny to show me the real granddaughter of Aphrodite? They are by no means puny. And they did show you. The goddess Aphrodite today exists as energy. She is capable of connecting for a time with the energy of any man, if she can see some meaningful reason to do so. That Elena Fadievya, whenever she was with you, had two energies inside her. There was a lot she could do during those days. There was a lot she succeeded in doing, and she managed to help you too. Yes, I am grateful to her. 
and to the goddess Aphrodite. All my concerns and unpleasant sensations connected with my assumption that all people were simply pawns in the hands of some kind of forces literally flew out of the window. Now, after my talk with Anastasia, a sense of confidence and peace set in. For some time, I just watched silently as Anastasia sat on the edge of my bed in the moonlight, her hands meekly folded atop her knees. And then, to this day, I cannot figure out how this happened. But I suddenly came out with, I realize that you, Anastasia, are a great goddess. And as I said this, I fell on my knees before her. A cry of pain and despair burst from Anastasia's lips. She immediately rose and stepped back from me, leaning against the wall and clasping her hands to her breast as though in prayer. Vladimir, I beg of you, get up off your knees. You should not bow down to me. Oh God, oh God, I have overdone it. I have been too great a haste. I have been in too great a haste. Forgive me for not making myself clear enough to your sons. In God's sight, Vladimir, all people are equal. They should not bow down to one another. I am simply a woman. I am man. You are so vastly different from all other people, Anastasia. So if you are simply man, then who are we? Who am I? You are man, too. Only as you are living out your life in vanity, you have not yet been able to think of what your purpose is. Moses, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, Rama, Buddha... Who are they? And how do you relate to them? Those are my elder brothers you have named, Vladimir. I am not in position to judge their works, but I shall say one thing. None of them had their fill of earthly love. That can't be. Every single one of them has millions of worshipping followers, even today. But worship does not mean love. It only exhausts the worshipper's power of thought, a power exclusive to man. Great is the egregor of my brothers. For millions of years, many people have fed it through their worship, and in so doing, each worshiper lost some of his energy. Over the centuries, there have been many willing to condemn the deeds of my brothers, and I could not understand why they made such great efforts to feed their own egregor, building up its energy over thousands of years. Nobody has been able to guess their secrets until the dawn of the present age. And my brothers decided to gather the accumulated energy into a single whole in order to distribute it to souls now living on the earth. A new millennium will soon be given birth, in which the gods will settle the earth. Those people whose conscious awareness will allow them to accept this energy in all its worth. Vladimir, I beg of you, get up off your knees. It is painful for any father to see his son bowed down and enslaved. It is only the dark forces that have always tried to demean man's significance. Vladimir, get up off your knees. Refuse to betray yourself. Do not separate yourself from me. Anastasia was extremely upset, and I did as she asked. I got up off my knees and said, I wasn't separating myself from you. On the contrary, it seems I've just begun to understand you. Only I don't agree that worship interferes with love. On the contrary, all believers say that they love God, and I am bowing before you as a goddess. But you are frightened for some reason. You be you've become upset. We have known each other for five years now, Vladimir. A lot of time has gone by since that night when our son was conceived. But ever since that time, not once you had the desire to touch me, to give me the look you gave to other women. Lack of understanding and now worship? Do not allow love to reveal itself. Worship does not bring forth children. Well, that's because you're not exactly a woman, Anastasia. You've become kind of an information node. It's not just me. Others, too, don't get your meaning right off. For example, that does don't, what does don't betray yourself mean? Why did you say that in reference to me? You wrote a letter to the president of Russia, Vladimir, but at the same time you have come to doubt yourself. You almost perished. You have ceased creating on your own and handed your problems to others, basically to a single president. That's because he's the only person in Russia who can realistically do anything. 
one person cannot do it by himself. The will of the majority is required. Besides, why did you send your letter only to one president? There are presidents in Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. But you've always talked about Russia. Besides, Russia is my motherland. But your passport says you are Belarusian. That's right, my father was Belarusian. And you spent your whole childhood in Ukraine. Well, yes, I did. And that was the best part I remember from my childhood. I remember the white cottage with its straw roof and the weir where I fished for mud loaches along with the neighborhood lads. And my grandmother and grandpa never once quarreled in my presence and never punished me. Yes, yes, Vladimir, and remember how you and your grandfather planted tiny seedlings in the garden? I do remember. Grandma would water them from a bucket. But you know that even today in the village of Kuzinichi in Ukraine, in the village where you were born, that garden has been preserved. Its trees are all crusty now, but they are still bearing fruit. They are waiting for you. So then, where is my motherland, Anastasia? It is within you. In me? In you. You can materialize it forever on the earth wherever your soul indicates. You're right. I have to figure it all out somehow. At the moment I get the feeling I'm scattered all over the land. Vladimir, you are tired. This whole day has brought a lot of emotion upon us. Lie down and go to sleep. By morning your sleep will have built up fresh strength for you, and you will have a new conscious awareness. I lay down on the bed and can feel Anastasia taking my hand in hers. Now a deep sleep would ensue, and I already knew that she could make it deep and peaceful so that everything would be all right by morning. But just before I dropped off, I managed to say, You know, Anastasia, could you please see to it that I shall be able once again to catch a glimpse of Russia's splendid future? Fine, go to sleep, Vladimir. You will see it. And Anastasia started singing very quietly, a wordless song like a lullaby. Anyway, it's great that people can program everything for themselves. I managed to think before plunging into a peaceful and pleasant dream about the future of Russia. Chapter 24. Eternity Lies Ahead for You and Me The rising sun shone through the uncurtained window straight onto the bed, waking me up. I had such a wonderful sleep, some kind of extraordinary strength, fantastic, was making its presence known inside me. I even felt like I wanted to do push-ups or some other kind of physical exercise, and I was in an excellent mood. From the kitchen, I could hear the clatter of dishes. Wow, I thought. Don't tell me that Anastasia is trying to make breakfast. She doesn't know how to cope with all the kitchen gadgets, or even how to turn on the gas. Maybe I'd better help her. I put on a tracksuit and opened the door to the kitchen. No sooner had I caught sight of Anastasia than a hot flash seemed to run through my entire body. This was the first time I had seen the Siberian recluse not in the taiga forest, not in her glade or by the seashore, but in a modern city woman's most typical surroundings, the kitchen. She was leaning over the gas stove, trying to regulate the burner. She kept turning the gas knob up and down, but the old cooker was not designed for any settings except high and low. In the kitchen, Anastasia appeared to be a completely normal woman. Now why did I go and scare her last night by bowing down on my knees? I'd probably had too much to drink and was beastly tired to boot. Anastasia felt my gaze upon her and turned to face me. One of her cheeks sported a dab of flour, and from underneath her bandana a braid of hair clung to her slightly perspiring forehead. Anastasia smiled, and her voice, that marvelous voice of hers. A splendid good morning for the coming day to you, Vladimir. 
You see, I have almost finished preparing breakfast. Just a wee bit more to do. You go and wash up, and by then everything will be ready. You go wash up, and do not worry. I shall not damage anything here. I have figured things out. Instead of heading for the bathroom right off, I stood there dumbfounded, just looking at Anastasia. For the first time in the five years we had known each other, I caught a glimpse of just how extraordinarily beautiful this woman really was. There are no words to describe a beauty like this. Even with a flower-spotted cheek, even without a fancy hairdo, her hair was simply tied back in a bun. Not to mention her plain, unfashionable clothing. She was still extraordinarily beautiful. I headed off to the bathroom, did a careful job of shaving, and took a shower. During all this time, I could not get my thought off this woman's beauty. When I came out of the bathroom, I sat down on the bed, which by this time had already been made. Instead of going into the kitchen, I just sat there, my mind still racing with thoughts about Anastasia. It's been five years now that I've known this woman, this recluse from the Siberian taiga. Five years. And how my whole life has changed over these five years. Even though we rarely get together, it seems she's always around. And it's really her. Of course, it was thanks to her that I was able to patch up my relationship with my daughter. We get along famously now. And as for my wife, well, even though I haven't been home in five years, I have talked with her on the, on the telephone, and I can tell by her voice that my wife now speaks to me without any sense of coldness or resentment. She tells me that everything's fine with the family. Anastasia, after all, she was the one who cured me. The doctors weren't able to, but she was. I knew myself that I was in danger of dying, and she cured me, and she made me famous too. Now I'm getting big royalties for my books. But they're still her words after all, and she always talks so tenderly, never gets angry. Even if I get mad at her without meaning to, she still won't get angry. Of course, she's changed my life drastically, but she's changed it for the better. It was she who bore me my son. Sure, it's not your normal situation. My son lives in her glade in Siberia, but it's probably better for him there, with her. She's so very kind. I need to say something nice to her and do something nice for her. Only what? There's nothing she needs. Funny how it turns out. Even if you owned half the world, she'd have nothing, she'd have more than you. Still, I really felt like giving her some kind of gift. A long time ago, I had bought her a pearl necklace, not artificial, but large, natural pearls. I decided this was a good moment to go and give it to her. I took the little jewelry box out of my suitcase, but instead of heading straight for the kitchen, I decided for some reason to change my clothes. In place of the tracksuit, I put on a pair of trousers, a white shirt, and even a tie. Then I put the necklace in my trouser, trouser pocket. But I was still too excited to go out to the kitchen. So I stood by the window, looking neat as a pin, until I managed to get hold of myself. What's going on here anyway? I thought to myself. It's high time. Enough of this silly emotionalism. And I walked out to the kitchen. Anastasia was sitting at the table she had got all set for breakfast waiting for me. She rose to greet me. By this time, she had done her hair and put on a very neat appearance. She got up and silently gave me one of her tender looks with her grayish-blue eyes, while I just stood there, not knowing what to say. Then I said, unexpectedly, using the formal form of address, "'Good day to you, Anastasia.' My formality completely took me aback, but she replied in all seriousness, as though she hadn't even noticed." Hello, Vladimir. Please sit down. Breakfast is waiting. Okay, I'll take a seat. But first, I wanted to say, I have something to tell you. But I couldn't remember the words. So tell me, Vladimir. But I completely forgot what I was going to say. I went up close to Anastasia, and she gave 
and gave her a kiss on the cheek, whereupon my whole body flared up. I felt hot all over, and Anastasia's cheeks flushed a deep red and her eyelids fluttered faster than usual. And when I spoke, it didn't sound like it was me at all, but some kind of constrained voice. That's from all my readers, Anastasia. So many people are grateful to you. From your readers? A big thank you to all the readers. Thank you very much, Anastasia quietly whispered. And then I gave her a quick kiss on her, on her other cheek and said, That one's for me. You are extremely good and kind, Anastasia, and you are extremely beautiful. Thank you for being you. You think I am beautiful, Vladimir? Thank you. Do you really think so? She was excited, too. I didn't know what to do next, but then I remembered the pearl necklace in my pocket. I hastily pulled it out and began trying to undo the clasp. This is a gift for you, Anastasia. Those are pearls, real ones. They're not fake. I know you don't like anything artificial, but those are real. But the clasp wouldn't budge. I jerked at it, and the thread broke, and all the little pearls that had been threaded onto it clattered to the floor and scattered in different directions. I sat down on the floor to pick them up. Anastasia began picking them up, too, only she managed to go faster. I watched as she deposited the pearls into the palm of her hand. She took a careful look at each one, and I just sat there entranced with her movements. I sat there on the floor, leaning against the wall, and watched her in astonishment. I thought to myself how common the standard kitchen was, but how uncommon and marvelous I felt everything was in my heart. Why? Probably because she was here in this very kitchen, Anastasia. She was right beside me, but for some reason I couldn't muster up enough resolve to embrace her. This woman, who back there five years ago in the taiga had seemed to be a somewhat abnormal recluse, now appeared as a star which had dropped in for a few moments from heaven. Here she was, right beside me, yet as a star she was unreachable. And the years, pity, the difference in years between us. I watched intently as Anastasia rose and put the pearl she had collected into a saucer on the table. Then she turned her head toward me. Entranced, I went on sitting there on the kitchen floor, leaning against the wall and looking into her grayish-blue eyes, and she never averted her tender gaze, even for a moment. Here you are, right beside me, Anastasia, but now I can't touch you. I feel as though you're a distant star in the sky. A star? That's how you feel? Why? Look! Here she is at your feet, this little star, turned into an ordinary woman. Anastasia quickly got down on her knees and sat next to me on the floor. She put her hands on my shoulder and rested her head on her hands. I could hear her heart beating, only my heart was beating a lot stronger. And her hair smelt of the taiga. Her breath was like a warm breeze infused with the intoxicating scent of flowers. Oh, why, Anastasia, why couldn't I have met you when I was young? You're so young, and just look at how old I am. I've lived almost half a century already. But it has taken me ages to break through to your wandering soul. Don't chase me away now. I'm getting old, Anastasia, and my life will soon be at an end. But while you are getting old... You will be able to plant your own family tree and lay the foundation for a city with a splendid future and a marvelous garden. I will try. Pity, I shall have such a short time to live on in this garden myself. It'll take quite a few years to grow. If you set it up, you will always live there. Always? Of course. Your body will grow old and die, but your soul will take flight. The souls of the dead take flight, I know that. The soul takes flight, and that's the end of it. Oh, what a marvelous day we have today. Why are you creating a joyless future, Vladimir? You are creating it for yourself. It's not me creating it. That's objective reality, plain and simple. First comes old age, then death, for everyone. And even you, my dear sweet dreamer, cannot come up with any other scenario. 
Anastasia shuddered all over and moved slightly to one side. Her kind and cheerful eyes peered into mine spark and sparkled, radiating a joyful confidence that nothing could withstand. I have no reason to come up with anything. There is only one truth. Death exists for the flesh. That is clear to everyone. For the flesh. In every other aspect, death is a dream, Vladimir. A dream? Yes, a dream. Anastasia got up on her knees and began talking, looking at me straight in the eye. But somehow, the way she talked silenced the kitchen radio. The sounds of voices and other noise outside the window as she spoke in a gentle voice. My dearest, eternity lies ahead for you and me. Life will always claim its own, you see. The littlest ray of sunshine glistens in the spring and the soul enrobes itself in its new things. But the decaying body does not embrace the ground in vain. Come spring, from our bodies will sprout new flowers and grass again. You shall forever hear the birds sing and drink in the drops of rain. In the blue sky above, the clouds, again and again, will entrance you with their dance. And if you, my dearest, should find yourself scattered across the unfathomable universe as little specks of dust, still refusing to believe, then from these specks of dust wandering through eternity, I shall begin to gather you up. And the tree you plant will help me to do this in the early spring to the place where your soul lies in unfeeling peace. It will stretch out its branch above. And those you have been kind to upon the earth will remember you with love. And if the sum total of earthly love is not enough to materialize you once again, then there is one, one whom you know, and on every plane of being, she will be flaming with a single breath of desire. Namely, materialize yourself, my love. There is one who will give herself over for a moment unto death. That will be you, Anastasia? Are you sure you will, you will be able to do such a thing, really? Any woman possesses the ability to do it if only she can compress the logos into her feelings. And what about you, Anastasia? Who will help you return to the earth once more? That I can do for myself. I need not bother anyone about it. But how shall I recognize you? After all, our lives will be quite different from before. Once you materialize upon the earthly plane, you will become a younger, a youngster once again. You will notice a snotty little red-haired girl in the garden next door to yours. Say a kind word to this slightly bow-legged youngster. Pay attention to that little maid. After you grow into your teens, you will start to notice pretty girls. Do not be in a hurry to join your destiny to theirs. In the meantime, in the garden next to yours, your friend will be growing too. Her face will be all freckles. She will not appear beautiful yet. At some point, you will notice her following you out of the corner of her eye. But do not laugh at her. Do not chase her off when she approaches you to draw your attention away from the more mature, beautiful women. Three springs will pass, and the neighbor girl will become a truly beautiful young lass. One day you will look at her and feel yourself aflame with love, and you will be happy with her, and she will be happy too. And it is my soul that will be living in a happy girl you choose. Thank you for that marvelous dream, Anastasia, my precious storyteller. I carefully embraced her by the shoulders and drew her close to me. I wanted to listen to how excitedly her heart was beating to feel the fragrance of this marvelous woman's hair, a woman who believes only in good in eternity, and possibly to grasp hold of it, if only like a straw, her incredible dreams. Her words about the future made everything around me seem more and more joyful. Maybe what you say, Anastasia, 
is all just words, but still they are marvelous words, and I feel more in my soul more joy in my soul when I hear them. The words of a dream can set a tremendous energy in motion. Man creates a future for himself through his dream, through the thoughts he cherishes. Believe me, Vladimir, everything will happen for the two of us exactly as I have described. But you are free in your dream, and you can change anything you like just by speaking different words. You are free. You have the liberty, and every man is a creator for himself. I shall change none of the words, Anastasia, spoken by you. I shall try to believe in them. Thank you. For what? For not spoiling eternity for the two of us. On this splendid sunny day, the two of us swam in the sea and sunned ourselves on the deserted seashore. That evening, Anastasia took her departure. As usual, she asked me not to see her off. I stood on the balcony and watched as she made her way along the pavement out by our building, her head covered with her kerchief, wearing the plainest of clothing and carrying her handmade cloth bag. She walked along, trying not to stand out among the other pedestrians. This same woman, who had created a splendid future for the whole country. But it will definitely come. People will turn her dream into reality and start living in this splendid world themselves. Before disappearing around the corner, Anastasia paused, turned in my direction, and waved. I waved back in farewell. I could no longer make out her facial features, but I was sure she was smiling. She's always smiling, because she believes in and creates only good. Perhaps it has to be that way. I waved back, whispering to myself, Thank you, my dear, sweet Anastasia. Appendix Desertification has affected the lands of the Rostov region. Up to 50% of the Selesin steppes, the Altai territory, a third of the Kulunda plain, and 13 other regions within the Russian Federation. Altogether, 6.5 million hectares of Russian farmland have now been taken over by the blowing sands, the largest single segment being in the Caspian lowlands, covering as much as 10% of their total area. The overall area of Russian farmland subject, either actually or potentially to desertification, approaches 50 million hectares. According to agrochemical indicators, Russia's agricultural lands are, on average, not very productive, especially outside the Chernozem belt. The layer of topsoil does not contain sufficient quantity of nutrients for proper cultiv cultivation. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, micronutrients, especially cobalt, molybdenum, and zinc, at least a third of the farmlands have acidic soil, and soil containing low concentrations of available phosphorus and potassium amount to 30% and 10% respectively. Over 43% of arable lands have a low humus content, and 15% of them, 45% outside the Chernozem belt. The proportion is critical. More than 75% of the farmlands of the Kalunga regions, as well as the Republic of Tuva, are low in humus. Experts believe that on average, with irregular and insufficient applications of, a, of organic fertilizer and improper cultivation pro practices, a significant depletion has taken place in Russia's soil content. Humus levels have been reduced to a minimum. 3.5 to 5 percent of topsoil in the central Chernozem regions and only 1.3 to 1.5 percent outside the Chernozem belt. Annual humus losses in farmland topsoil are pegged at 0.6 to 0.7 tons per hectare, as much as one ton per hectare in Chernozem areas. This means an annual nationwide loss of approximately 80 million tons it has been proved that there is almost a perfect linear relationship between the humus reserves in basic soil types 
and the productivity of major agricultural crops. A one ton per hectare increase in humus levels means an increase in the average long-term productivity of cereal crops of 10 to 15 kilograms per hectare. For a number of crops cultivated under the various soil clim climatic conditions, this amount corresponds to 30 kilograms of cereal crop units. For every one centimeter decrease in humus depth in the Chernozem topsoil under the influence of either natural or man-made factors, e.g. erosion, cereal crop productivity falls by 100 kilograms per hectare. Over the course of many years, Russian, Russia's soil resources have been extensively exploited by various means and nutrients have often been eliminated through the harvesting process at a faster rate than they could be replenished. Agricultural scientists warn that such extensive exploitation, exploitation of the soil's fertility will lead to an irreversible degradation. Trends in overall cereal output are cited as evidence of this. The annual manure application required to maintain constant humus levels in the soil should amount to between 7 and 15 tons per hectare. This means adding to the soil a minimum, a minimum of 1 billion tons of organic fertilizer each year. Russia today employs about 100 to 120 million tons or approximately 10 times less than is required. What is the current situation with regard to conservation of soil resources? Centralized financing of soil improvement projects has been completely cut off, and the scope of these projects has been drastically reduced. Financing now comes out of local budgets since 1993, out of land taxes, with 30% of the conservation program expenses to be paid by land users. As a result, from 1994 to the present, all projects for applying peat manure compost in non chernozem areas, as well as lime treatment of acidic soils, delivery of liming materials and bone meal, and phosphate application have pretty well ceased on most Russian territories because local authorities do not have funds for carrying out agrochemical projects. This has contributed to the failure of practically all comprehensive federal soil improvement and agricultural development programs initiated by the Russian government and the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. In view of the above, we can now speak of the escalating degradation of Russia's topsoil, which threatens its ecological and food security, as well as its national security as a whole.